Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Faith Fellowship Sunday School. It's good to be with you once again. Today, we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 13. But before we begin, please bow your heads with me right now as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day and this opportunity to have fellowship with the saints, Lord God, and just go through your word and learn and grow and develop in our faith. So Holy Spirit, you're welcome right now to be a part of what we're about to do in Jesus name. Amen. Well, guys, Acts chapter 13 begins an interesting period. If you remember, the the book of Acts begins with what is a part of the great commission that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 28. When he says to the disciples to remain in Jerusalem and stay there until you receive power, you're going to be witnesses of me in, in Judea, Samaria, and even until the ends of the earth. So that commission was given by Jesus, and it was going to develop in phases as we've been studying. Men and women have been going bit by bit, sharing the faith, but now it's about to begin in earnest in a way that the world is about to experience it beyond the borders of Israel and kind of that general area. Now it's about to reach into various places, even Eastern Asia. So we pick up in Acts chapter 13, where the church in Antioch has some great and awesome leaders. Now, in Antioch, which is Syria, is an interesting place for the gospel to really be launched, but it was God's divine choice. You think of maybe Jerusalem being the first for the missionary journey that Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas was about to embark upon, but it was actually in Antioch. And Antioch is a first for a lot of different things. As we said last time, we were first called Christians in Antioch. Antioch is about to begin the first real missionary journey right now by Paul and Barnabas. Antioch was pretty much known as the first real Gentile congregation where Gentiles were assembled and the gospel was being preached. And it was a community of believers. So Antioch was first for a lot of different things. And it was going to be kind of the the, in a sense, the capital of Christianity in a small way. But in this place where we're about to start reading, there were some very powerful people who were in the faith. So turn with me to Acts chapter 13 as we pick up there. I'm going to begin in verse 1. It says, Now in the church in Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them, and they sent them off. Now, it's interestingly enough, they were fasting and praying together, which, uh, you know, churches should do more often. Really? Because that gave the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to speak to them. Many times churches and today have become a, a gathering of people that sing a few songs and just kind of launch into our religious duties in a sense. And I think many churches have become guilty of that. And we all have to be careful that the early church really demonstrated something for us, and that is that fasting and prayer is an essential part of the building of the body and also hearing from the Lord and giving direction by the Holy Spirit. So as they were fasting and praying and worshiping the Lord, the Lord spoke. He said, separate from me Barnabas and Paul and send them out for the work that I'm about to send them to. So now actually missionary work and evangelism in this way is about to be launched at this particular moment in time. It's probably around 45 AD. So Jesus has been dead now only about, what, 10 years? It depends on what, how you look at it, 10 to 12 years based on when you believe the death and resurrection took place. But about, you know, uh, 12, 13 years now. And so Paul has been brought back and Barnabas and him have teamed up. 
and God is about to use them in a mighty way. You know, this brings to my mind, to a certain degree, the, something that's, you know, familiar to me, that God has united myself and Pastor Gary. He did this years ago for the work that he had called us to. And for many, many years, we have been serving together, doing the work of the Lord. I'm not in any means trying to compare us to Paul and Barnabas, but I will say this, is that God sometimes develops teams like this to send them out to accomplish his work and his will. And so together, Pastor Gary and I have been a team for a lot of years together. This is my 22nd year since I came back to the Bay Area, and we've been ministering together all that time. Of course, Pastor Gary, 25 years, 27 years almost now. And so, but the Lord has brought us together and he did something very similar to Paul and Barnabas in their time. And he sent them out to do the work of the ministry. And you know, all of us are men, fallible. We make mistakes, we fall short, but God has to use somebody or he has chosen to use somebody. And you know what? He's kind of, in a sense, limited to us human beings. And so the best of us can sometimes be the worst of us. But God uses men and women to accomplish his purposes. So Paul and Barnabas are being sent out on this first missionary journey, which they were going to cover a part of eastern, what was known then as Eastern Asia, in the southern part of Turkey, um, heading west as if you were going to Europe but they only traveled about 1,200 miles or so, and they were gonna preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it says that the Lord set them apart, but I wanna think, of, want you to focus on a couple of things before we go further. There were men in that church, one named Simeon, and I just read to you about him, and Lucius of Cyrene. Now, we believe because of uh, Lucius being from Cyrene, he's probably African. And Simeon, who was called Niger, which means black, was probably a, a, a black African man or a black man, dark skinned man. Remember, we studied about the Ethiopian eunuch and Ethiopia meant dark skinned people. So this racial thing in the church as it relates to color is more a contemporary construct. As you can see in the early church, they were diverse. They were a diverse people. This man, Simeon, uh, was black, it seems, from the scriptures, Simon or uh, Lucius from Cyrene. And these were powerful men, and they were a part of those who ordained Paul and Barnabas to go out on their first missionary journey. Now, why is that important? It's not important just to me because I'm a black man or an African-American man, but it's important because it tells us in our beginning or the early origins of the church, race and skin color was not an issue. That became more something that we kind of brought into focus in our time and, and in the early uh, centuries in America. You know, church actually divided people when God designed it to bring us together. It was the Lord who says and instructed us that we are all one in Christ. So this racial component became a construct of men and not God. So, and how about Manayan? He was a, uh, it says, brought up with Herod Antipas. And so, this man was brought up in the household of Herod, but he was one of the early converts too and became powerful in the church of God. And so the church was open to all who were willing to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. At that time, the world was polytheistic in a lot of ways, but in just a little while, in some years to come, another faith was going to rise up called Islam. Now, at this time, Christianity is starting to spread. It's going to be launched here from Antioch, and it's going to spread. And then one day, an emperor is going to come into power by the name of Constantine around the, the third century AD, and he's going to 
make Christianity the, the religion of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. But then around the 7th century or so, well, Muhammad came into existence around the 5th century, around 570 AD. He was going to be the real originator of the Islamic faith. And then later on throughout the centuries leading up to a man by the name of Saladin, the Middle East, which began in Christianity, is going to turn to Islam. But right now, in Syria today, which is where Antioch is, where the first missionary journey was launched, Antioch became a Christian environment or a Christian community. Now, as you know, today in Syria, it's mostly Muslim or Islamic. But there are still, I believe it says, around 1.2 million Christians trying to survive in an Islamic world right now and as you can imagine they're probably being persecuted and they are being persecuted often so the historical part of where we are right now is to give us a sense that christianity at one time was a small group that became a world religion and is to this day but everything starts somewhere that's why the bible teaches not to despise small beginnings but also we're going to see as the years pass and history begins to fully develop after the birth of the church, that there are many reasons why the Bible teaches not being unequally yoked. Because a mixture of religions taking place is going to water down religion or the way the leader of those faiths, faith intended it to be. You see, Islam started to work its way into society, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I want you to know that Christianity is about to take center stage here, but as you know, to this present day now, Islam has taken over the Middle East. And it also teaches that, you know, the world does actually change. And when people are not true to what they believe, anything can happen, and not all positive. So being true to your faith is very, very important because, I mean, after a person becomes a Christian, where else do you go? What else is of greater height or greater authority than becoming a Christian? Christianity has eternal implications, meaning your soul is saved for eternity after you become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the world as we're about to see it is about to take the Christian uh, path. But as you can see today, the Middle East is more mostly Islamic. Christians dispersed in many places and in small gatherings in the Middle East, but Islam has taken full and center stage. So it's important that we just consider why the Bible really preaches being equally yoked. Because through marriages and trade and commerce and interacting with other people, the Christian faith is going to be watered down over the years. And you probably know somebody who was a Christian, born-again believer, and married outside of the faith. And as you see them now, you realize they're not what they used to be, maybe, or they're a shadow of what they were in the faith. Because one of those belief systems is going to succumb to the other, or they're going to emerge in such a way that neither of them are effective or as effective as the designer intended them to be. That's the way the world works. So the best thing you can do as a Christian, if you're single, is to marry, when it's time, a believer. Just take that advice right now. If you're a Christian and you're ready to get married or when you're ready to get married, make sure you marry a believer. It's going to make all the difference in the world. And it's going to impact your children one way or another if you choose to marry outside of the faith. 
The hope is that if you do, your unbelieving or alternative faith spouse partner will come to Christianity. That would be great, but it's not a guarantee. So now back to Acts chapter 13. These men are on their missionary journey, the first one of Paul the Apostle. And we're also about to find right now in this chapter that Paul is about to go from Saul to Paul. And it's going to be that way throughout Scripture. So let's continue reading. I'm going to pick up in verse four. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus, which is an island. Been there when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Now, John Mark, he's introduced right here. It's very important because John Mark, even as this team of Paul and Barnabas are brought together, John Mark being introduced right here is going to be a central part of why they break up as a team. Maybe it was the plan of God all along. But John Mark is actually going to be the catalyst that actually leads to a breakup between two great men of God. And they go on and serve God in their various capacities. But it's a breach or a break is going to happen. So it says they travel through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar Jesus or son of Jesus or son of Jesus. So now they're in this place called Paphos and it's kind of like at the gate or the gatekeeper, a man by the name of Elimus appears. He's a sorcerer. What does that tell you? He probably operates in or does operate in demonic power or demonic authority. So as they arrive at this place, the first person they encounter, it seems from the story, is a sorcerer, the gatekeeper. And this sorcerer has a job. Now, Paul and Barnabas, their purpose is to evangelize the Gentile world. They run into Elamus. His job is to make sure they don't, which is what Satan does. And so they run into this guy, Elamus, and it says, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The procon proconsul, an intelligent man, went or sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Now, this political leader, Sergius Paulus, wanted to hear the gospel message, which is exactly why Paul and Barnabas were sent on this mission. But the gatekeeper, Elimus, says, I'm going to have to divert you from hearing this message. Now, take note of this, is that in this story, as it's taking place, the gospel is about to reach the halls of the political realm or the political arena. They're about to break through in the political realm by reaching out to this man or this man, Sergius Paulus, reaching out to them. They're about to have an impact on the political world right now, as we've been talking about in my little series, God, the uh, politics and the church. God moves in those areas because those areas have great influence on the land and the decision making of the people and the direction that a nation may go. That's why the Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So God moves in the political arena, but so does Satan. So does Satan. But we'll find here who's the greater authority. Then it says, then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he's about to be converted to Paul or about to be call that his Roman name, Paul. It says, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elamus and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now, this man, Elamus, 
this gatekeeper was in this position to always thwart the work of the Lord. Right now, there are counselors, there are lobbyists, there are advisors in Washington, D.C. In fact, it's full of them. One street in Washington, D.C. is called K Street. All that's on that street are lobbyists, people that lobby politicians, spreading the money around. Well, Elamus was there in that position for a purpose. He was Satan's tool there. But God wanted to break through into that arena, into that realm. And so God deals with this man, Elamus, because God has a plan. This is my first missionary journey, says the Lord, that I'm sending them on, and I'm going to guard their way. So it says, now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Now, see, the proconsul believes. Now, what that means is, in the political arena, arena, there is a voice now for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need political leaders who love the Lord Jesus Christ and become a voice in the halls of Congress. Listen, are you pleased with the direction of our nation right now? Some of the things that are going on, some of the counsel that's being given by those gatekeepers in Washington, D.C. right now who are speaking into the ears of the political leaders in our nation. Somebody had to concoct a scheme, a scheme that the government was going to support and back up the taking of innocent lives. Now, remember, Elamus, as Paul said, was full of deceit and trickery. What he was able to do was manipulate leaders so that the devil's will might be accomplished and not the will of the Lord. That's why he got in the way of Paul and Barnabas, because they brought a different authority with them in an area where Satan thought was his domain. In the halls of Congress, in politics, we need religious leaders or we need people who love the Lord Jesus Christ because some of the decisions that are being made are atrocious. I don't have to tell you that. You see it right now with your own eyes. But you see, God breaks through where God wants to break through. There is no greater power than the power of the Lord. So in this story on their first missionary journey, they encounter the gatekeeper Elamus. God breaks through him, blinds him so that he cannot see. Remember, it says this about the gospel. The God of this world, Satan, blinds the minds of, of believers or people so that they cannot see the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. His job is to blind them so that they cannot see or receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. In this story, God blinds him. God blinds him. And it says for a time, maybe when his eyes are open, he'll be able to see the light of the gospel. Who knows? But it says in verse 13, from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. So now John Mark, who was just introduced earlier, is going to leave them on their first missionary journey. Now, these things are a little, they're setups. For things to come. You, you wonder why they're inserted or why Luke put these things there because they serve as a introductory to what's going to later happen in the scriptures. So we see now as so far as we've gotten right now that in the early church diversity was common. It was not an issue. We did read, though, about the Hebrew and Grecian Jews and their conflict that they had over the distribution of food. But that wasn't more likely a, um, a color thing more than it was a just a different people group that was they were fighting for 
whatever it was they wanted in the positions of authority as it relates to food. I can relate to that. I mean, golly, people get hungry, but it shouldn't cause a rift in the church. Now, in Revelation chapter nine, I want to turn there for a minute because I want to bring something to to the forefront or Revelation chapter seven. And I'm going to pick up in verse nine. Now, John is writing the book of Revelation, and I'm going to show you how the reality of things as it relates to people groups, how insignificant the, the color thing or the, the thing that we see with our own eyes that bring division, we're going to look at how God sees it. Now, in Revelation chapter 7, because racism, this color thing, is not a God thing. Listen how John describes what God shows him in heaven. Because God had shown John just some incredible things. In Revelation chapter 7, beginning in verse 9, it says, After this I, John, looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Now, the people or the nations, ethnos, means ethnicities. So somehow John was able to discern that there was a difference in the visual perspective that he had of these people that are standing before the throne of the Lamb. Something showed him or he was able to discern that they were not all the same in their color or in the way they looked or even in their language, their tongue, he was able to discern that there was a difference. And you see, right now he's looking into heaven and it says they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, it goes on, and you read this at your leisure. It goes on to say that one of the elders asked John, who do you think they are? And John, I don't know, basically. And he says, they are those who have come. Who is this multitude? They are those who have come out of the great tribulation. And so out of the great tribulation, there is this people group, or there are these people that are standing before the throne of the Lamb of God, and they're worshiping, saying salvation belongs to our God. And so John was able to discern that they were different in color. There were diverse things that he could pick up on. And so this whole race thing that we have going is not a God thing. In fact, you know, what we ought to do is just forget about it. You know what? If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're my brother, you're my sister, and that's just the way it is. Settle that in your mind and in your heart. It doesn't matter to me what you look like, and I mean that with all my heart. I could care less what you look like. I just know that if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to know each other forever, and it has nothing to do with your skin color. So in the early church, there was diversity. In our church, Faith Fellowship, there is diversity. There is diversity. There are different people groups. And it doesn't matter to me. And I love it because we all bring something different to the table. But we have this in common, that we're all one in Christ Jesus. We are all one in Christ. Now, we're going to turn back to Acts chapter 13 and continue. Now it says, from Perga, they went to Pisidian Antioch. This is the other Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. So when they were gathered and they were in this synagogue gathering place, which is what synagogue means, they were Jews. Converts, Paul and Silas, now they are in the synagogue, in the gathering place where the believers had come together and they were noticed. And by the, the leader of the synagogue, perhaps, 
motioned to them and asked them, brothers and sisters, if brothers, if you have anything to share, please speak to the body. Please speak to the congregation. And in verse 16, it says, Paul, standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you right now where we are in this this portion. He's about to give a historical reference to them that they were going to be able to relate to because many of them were Jewish. He was going to give a history lesson as he walked his way through to what he was ultimately going to tell them why Jesus Christ is the Messiah. I want you to be able to recite, and I've told you this before, I would like for all of us to be able to recite biblical history in a way that makes sense, in a way that we can show that we understand the message of God and how he developed what we now call our faith. Because Christianity is first called Christianity here in Antioch or where we began chapter 13. But before you get to that, there's this whole other Bible, all of this history leading up to that moment. And we should be able to, as believers and especially as mature Christians, we should be able to kind of recite a historical uh, background of our faith. So Paul is about to do that. And I hope you will develop in your faith to be able to do something very similar to what he's about to do. Paul says in verse 17, the God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. When were they in Egypt? You know the story. But God made them prosper. And it says with mighty power, he led them out of that country. What you should be able to recite to a certain degree is why they were in Egypt anyway or in the first place. Then it says for about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. Well, what is this wilderness experience he's talking about? What are the 40 years he's relating to? After he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance, all this took about 450 years. So now they go into Egypt. You remember the story, Exodus chapter one. They go into Egypt, about 70 people, and then they come out about three million or so. And so now a 450 year period passes and Paul begins to describe that. And they conquered the land of Canaan. It says after this, God gave them judges. Remember, what is the book of Judges all about? Until the time of Samuel, the prophet, now the prophet steps onto the scene. Then the people asked for a king and he gave them Saul. Remember the story in 1 Samuel chapter 9 or 8 and 9, they asked for a king. And it says, then the people asked for a king and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and he will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Now, if you follow the genealogy of Jesus, you will find that David is there. Jesse's there. You will find that out of that tribe came Jesus. And so Paul gave them a quick history lesson, which I hope all of you will be able to do at some point in your walk with the Lord. So he's, he did that to lead up to the Messiah. And it says, from this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. Of Israel. As John was contemplating, completing his work, he said, who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you're looking for, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. We're going to stop right there today. But I wanted to start chapter 13 with this launch into the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. And how this church in Antioch had developed in such a way that there were powerful men there, people and perhaps women of faith. But they point out the men, I'll just say. 
Ladies, please don't get offended. And these men were fasting and praying. And God spoke to them by the Holy Spirit. It's time for you to launch out into the rest of the world and begin to fulfill my great commission. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The time has now come. Paul and Barnabas are sent out from Antioch where we were first called Christians on their first missionary journey. There were people of color, all kinds of colors in that church, which shows diversity is not a new thing. It was there in the beginning. So consider these things. We'll pick up next week in Acts chapter 13 and we'll just continue to break bread in the word of God. So may God richly bless you this week and just have a great time in Jesus. See you soon.